Hi, everybody. I'm Heather. And like was just announced, I'm going to be talking about triaging and tackling tech debt. I'm going to start with a quote. And as an evolving program is continually changed, its complexity, reflecting deteriorating structure, increases unless work is done to maintain or reduce it. This quote is by Meyer Lehman. He studied the role of software evolution as a professor and computer scientist and wrote a set of laws about it called Lehman's Laws. When I read this quote, I was struck by the idea of software being the structure that deteriorates over time and was reminded by a game that I had played in my life, Jenga. So maybe this Jenga tower represents the very beginning of the software development process. You've shipped a brand new feature or perhaps released your new app and you really like understand this bit of code. Maybe it's like the best that you've ever written, very nicely coupled, it's solving a use case perfectly. But over time, features are going to be added and removed. Uh, you're going to refactor code, split things out into modules. Uh, you may discover that parts of your application are unnecessary, or perhaps that other parts are growing more popular and starting to hit scaling concerns. Um, in any case, one day you may wake up and making a change to that <laughs> application may start to feel a little like this. If it feels like this to try to make a change, you may be experiencing some of the effects of tech debt. Um, but we don't call it tech Jenga, although sometimes it sounds more fun if we did. Um, so I wanted to look into where that particular uh, term was coined. So I have another quote. I like quotes. Um, this is from Ward Cunningham, who was the uh, originator, at least according to my Google searches, of this phrase. He said that shipping first-time code is like going into debt. A little bit of debt speeds development, but every minute spent on not quite right code counts as interest on that debt. So the analogy that he's making here is that uh, tech debt is like monetary debt. So let's explore that a little. Uh, traditional debt has a couple of key components that are relatively consistent. One, there's always some principal amount. This is the amount that you have borrowed uh, and gone into debt for. There's usually an interest rate, which is a percentage of the principal uh, that you pay while you have this loan. There's usually uh, a duration of the loan. And finally, calculating uh, using the three factors above, there's a monthly payment. Um, the conclusion that I drew from this is that Debt is very factual. It's easy to quantify. There are very exact numbers involved. And I think we like this analogy because uh, as developers or even as people working in tech in general, uh, this is familiar and comforting to us because it's already how we measure a lot of our existing uh, successes. You know, we increased our revenue. Perhaps our failures or areas of concern. Let's look into why our monthly active users were down 5%. Uh, and we even think about projects and people in terms of resourcing, which comes down to like terms like headcount. Um, but tech debt is not exactly like monetary debt. It has a couple of broader themes, which I'll go into now. Usually there's some short-term gain involved, whether this is uh, more time or the convenience of doing things a certain way. Uh, there's usually also a long-term cost. Uh, maybe over time it becomes harder and harder to make changes, it takes longer and longer, and your software is overall less maintainable. It also grows non-linearly complex, which is to say that it's not going to get harder and harder on a schedule. Uh, you may make changes where suddenly a small piece of tech debt grows exponentially large, or it's rather benign and it will stay the same uh, over time. And finally, the pain of tech debt is incurred when you use that code or when you try to change it um, rather than, again, on any sort of particular cadence. In other words, tech debt is much more conceptual. It's a big bucket of problems that all get called uh, under this one umbrella term. I heard somebody at my table say that it's like that drawer in your kitchen that you just have like all of that, <laughs> all of your garlic presses and <laughs> other tools shoved into. Um, so there's also a couple of things that I think make tech debt really interesting um, and unique and, again, different than this original analogy. Um, tech debt can be taken on unconsciously or consciously. I think in an ideal world, 
you want to take on tech debt consciously as much as possible. Uh, it should be a explicit trade-off that you make for all of its benefits while understanding its costs. However, unconscious tech debt is inevitable. And one of the reasons why is that tech debt occurs when our understanding of products change. Um, we write software to solve problems. And a business that's growing uh, is going to go deeper into those problems and therefore have a greater understanding or perhaps start to address new problems and the intersection of those problems. When that happens, the code, unless it's changed, is going to fall behind and incur debt because it represents something that is outdated. Third, there's inherent risk in addressing tech debt. Um, while you may not like working in a particular code area, if that code area is serving a purpose, changing it may disrupt that purpose. It may cause bugs. It may cause an outage. Um, so it's not a clear-cut decision that it is worth addressing, which leads into my next point, that the reward can be ambiguous. Um, we're always prioritizing as developers, and there's a definite opportunity cost in doing one thing over doing something else. So the reward of solving tech debt may feel a little more ambiguous than the reward of delivering a new feature that a particular customer has been asking you for. Finally, tech debt is highly subjective. People may disagree on what tech debt uh, the team has or how bad it is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the first ways that we tend to interface with tech debt or start to feel in our heads like, gosh, this is a really like annoying thing that I wish was different is through like pain. As developers, we use pain, there it is, um, <laughs> to kind of be our internal uh, compasses for when we think that something is wrong. Um, and pain is something that is highly subjective. But as this very famous pain chart illuminates, uh, it doesn't mean that it's not something that can be uh, talked about in a way that can be understood by others. So in this pain chart, um, you can define your pain on a scale of 0 to 10. And that will help others understand what kind of uh, feelings and pain that you are personally experiencing. So when we talk about pain, it's not usually like our top level metrics at our jobs. But there are some things that can be indicators of pain. We have uh, bugs. Maybe you track the number of bugs or the number of bugs uh, filed, fixed, et cetera. We have the uptime of our services. Are people able to use our product uh, whenever they want, 24-7? We have the calculation of uh, estimating new work and features, so story points or t-shirt sizing or whatever system you may use. And we have the ratings and feedback of our customers, internal or external, as Jeremy's talk highlighted. Um, I think there's a whole separate talk in here on how you can quantify tech debt really precisely and convincingly, but I didn't write that talk. So I'm going to just say that the first step is acknowledging that tech debt is happening. Once you can acknowledge it, uh, it's a much smoother sailing from there. Uh, so we did this at my company. This was a graph that was presented at an all hands. Uh, the bar chart represents uh, users, engineers, who are shipping code um, in our main uh, repo. And the line is like the number of SEV1 incidents, which is our kind of top tier, all hands on deck, something's on fire. And that line is growing pretty linearly with the number of engineers. And this was a really powerful way of representing that uh, the tech debt is there. It's going to grow as we have more engineers join. And the pain uh, that's caused by that tech debt is also going to grow unless acted upon by an outside force. So the main point of my talk is a tale of two tech debts, which is when we decided to act upon certain things that we had determined were painful. OK, the four, first story I'm going to tell requires some uh, background. Convoy is about five years old. When we started, we originally chose JavaScript as our language of choice. There were a lot of advantages to that. We could write our front end and back end code in the same language. It's relatively fast to prototype on. There's a lot of open source tooling and other things that we could use right out of the box. But over time, we got pretty excited about TypeScript, which is a superset of JavaScript which provides static compile time checking, uh, object-oriented principles, I guess, like classes and interfaces, um, and a lot of really good things that we thought would help our development flow. So we decided to switch over, but we had this like active tech debt where we had a lot of JavaScript, 
a lot of JavaScript is still being written, but we wanted to move more to TypeScript. Um, so this was tech debt because writing more JavaScript was faster at the time because other files were already written in JavaScript. And that provided a lot better examples of uh, how we wrote code. But writing more JavaScript meant that eventually, uh, when we switched over, there would be more files that we had to convert to TypeScript. This also could grow non-linearly complex because when I added a new JavaScript file or a bit of logic, I might introduce things that make it more difficult to convert eventually to TypeScript. A specific example of this was our usage of third-party libraries that may have not been written to be TypeScript compatible. And finally, every time I modified a JavaScript file, I potentially created bugs due to poor typing that would have been solved by moving to TypeScript. But this isn't necessarily an easy problem to fix for a couple of reasons. One, this was nobody's problem in particular. If I was making a small change to some JavaScript to accomplish a certain task, it may not justify dropping everything and converting that whole file. Second, it was really easy to add more JavaScript. Uh, we were gaining a lot of engineers, we still are, and it's not easy to socialize uh, what we want our best practices to be. So if you're a new engineer and you see a directory and everything's written in JavaScript, your first instinct is probably going to be to do the same. Third, this problem was voluminous. We couldn't have individuals go be heroes and solve this problem all for themselves. Um, we would need a dedicated, large effort to fix it. So how did we go through this? The first step was that we attempted to quantify it. We looked at ship bugs that could have been prevented by the type checking that TypeScript provided. And then on the other side of that, we looked at bugs found and fixed when those files were converted to TypeScript. So some were very latent and we didn't even know they were there until we uh, converted the file. The second thing that we did was to stop the bleeding, which is to create a better mechanism to prevent new JavaScript from being checked in. This is a list of our checks that run against your branch before you're allowed to merge into master. That bottom check is just making sure that no new JavaScript files have been added. And if there was a JavaScript file added, it would fail with a message as to why. The third thing that we did was called TypeScript conversion parties. So this was a meeting that was hosted once every two weeks. And it was a really interesting concept. It was decentralized and entirely volunteer driven. A couple of engineers in our org just organized it uh, themselves every week. It was completely optional, like you could come if you wanted to. If you had other concerns, you would, uh, if there was no problem, you could say, uh, keep doing your regular work. It was held at the end of the work day, like four-ish. It was incentivized. We brought in pizza and beer for anybody who wanted to come. It had minimal risk of impact just by the nature of switching from JavaScript to TypeScript. Because TypeScript was a superset of uh, JavaScript, we could make sure that any code being checked in would not change the underlying runtime execution. It was highly educational. Um, this was a really popular meeting with new hires or people new to our technology stack because it was a great place to get information on why we use TypeScript and learning how to use TypeScript from people who were clearly interested in it. Cool, so now I have to switch into the second problem, which I call the shipment problem. And to do that, I'm gonna have to talk a little more about what our company does as a business. So Convoy is called a digital freight brokerage, uh, which means that we essentially help companies get their, fr their freight shipped from point A to point B by matching them with a truck and driver. So when I asked the question, what is a shipment? Uh, the answer was, it's basically a truck of stuff that's going from one place to another. However, over the course of the past almost five years, uh, that definition has been stretched to its limits. So if I ask again these days, what is a shipment? Um, there's a lot of different answers. And I've just illustrated one particular answer here, which is our batching program. This program solves the problem where a driver would be headquartered in point A, and when they took a load from point A to point B, they would not have a load to take them back from point B to point A. So they either had to choose to drive those miles empty and not be paid, or to severely limit the area in which they were willing to operate. We introduced batching so that we could take two different loads and give the driver a route from point A to point B that was full, and a route from point B to point A that was full. But at this point, the definition of a load would change depending on who you asked. To the driver, they only cared about the fact that they had a full round trip. 
But to the people, the companies that we were doing business with, they may only be interested in one leg or another. So when we ask, like, what is a shipment, it could be a batch of stuff. And there were several other programs like this that were spinning up that were really stretching the idea of what we called a single load. So the debt here that we had was that our definition was changing. Really what was happening is a lot of definitions were coming in on the same core entity at the same time. And this was tech debt because using the existing model helped us build fast prototypes. But the more projects relying on this same model, the harder it was for us to change in the future. Every new project was using this old model in increasingly creative ways to accomplish their objectives, which made it more and more complex to ever undo some of those choices. And every time you have to change code in an area that's using something in a very creative way, you incur a lot of overhead and potential bugs. So this was also a painful problem to fix. It even has like the eight on the pain scale. <laughs> Um, new projects using this model were pervasive across all of our repositories and products. It affected our mobile app, it affected our web apps, it affected our internal marketplace, it affected our internal users. And when we were stretching this model, it could be sometimes hard to glean meaningful metrics on how things were performing. So you don't know what you don't know. We couldn't even tell all of the problems that we were encountering because some metrics were so hard to derive. Any attempt to change or improve things could not disrupt the existing business. And this entity was core to like all of our business. Um, so it was high risk. And finally, almost every team was impacted, which means that there were a lot of opinions and stakeholders. So solving this problem started the same way. We attempted to quantify it. We looked at the number of engineers interacting with this singular model, which was almost everyone. We looked at the current volume and desire to scale some of these projects like batching. We looked at future projects that we were thinking about and how they might further stretch our single definition. And finally, we actually took the lack of quantifiable metrics as an input metric that we needed to change things. The second step, however, was quite different. Um, we created a team. And if you're wondering like, what the heck that image is on the right, I'm not totally sure. But because they are changing the shipment model, they call themselves the mod squad. And I think it's really catchy. Um, so this was a team that was spun up with dedicated resourcing that was given the charter of like, go fix this problem. So they went around and collected buy-in from all the teams impacted, again, almost everyone. And this team would prevent any case in the future where the model would be neglected because everyone was using it, but nobody was chartered with taking care of it, which I've defined up there as the tragedy of the commons problem. The third step was to determine an MVP and commit which was to de-risk the project, uh, design a solution, create milestones against that solution, and build an MVP in a targeted area to prove that the new solution worked. OK, so these are two very different stories, but I'm going to go into a lightning round of some takeaways. So the first part is tech debt is inherent. There was no like singular mistake that you can point to and say, like, oh, if they hadn't done that, like everything would have been fine. Neither our decision to use JavaScript or our original definition of a shipment was wrong, but over time, tech debt happens. The second part is that making it conscious is step one. If you don't know there's a problem, you're not going to be spending time figuring out how to fix it. So this could be either raising bugs, raising the lack of metrics, um, raising the amount of importance of a particular thing being raised can help understand that something needs to change. The third takeaway is that the solution starts with an MVP. These problems were too big for individuals to fix all by themselves, but creating an MVP and collecting buy-in can actually not only educate others about what you're trying to do, but also while our JavaScript is an existing source of tech debt, it is probably not worth the gears of our business grinding to a halt to go convert all of it to TypeScript. On the other hand, the Shimon model affected the ability of our business to grow and deliver value to our customers. So the fixes, in, uh, <laughs> the fixes, therefore, matched how big the problem was and how urgent it was to, to drive down that tech debt. Um, fifth, like there's no single process, or at least not one that I've presented to you. I think I've seen a lot of creativity in how teams define their tech debt, drill it down, dedicate time for it. Uh, and I would just say, like, 
it's probably best to keep an open mind and to look into a variety of different solutions that can serve you know, the many different types of problems that you'll find and call tech debt in your career. Thanks.